Okay, so we are going to be learning about the new imperialism uh, this afternoon, and this kind of entails European countries going to take over parts of Africa and also parts of Asia. So we'll go into more specific examples of those different types of imperialism in history. And so our time frame in that where we are looking at is 1870 to 1914. We're still in that same time frame that we talked about yesterday, working towards World War I. Now, I just wanted to review a little bit from the main concept that we learned about yesterday, and that is what is imperialism? So hopefully you're thinking to yourself right now that imperialism is one country trying to take over another country. Now, normally, yes, it is a stronger nation that tries to dominate or take over a weaker nation. Now, yesterday we also talked about the five motives of imperialism, and you know, you guys did that assignment over it as well, too. So hopefully you're going through your hand actions in your mind or doing them right now. But our five motives are economic, also money, political. And we also refer to that as power, religious, trying to spread Christianity throughout these new regions of the world, exploratory and ideological. And remember, ideological refers mostly to the white man's burden. So that is your different motives of imperialism and imperialism itself. So I just wanted you guys to take a quick glance at this map because this is what we are going to be working towards as we go through this lecture today. You can see down at the bottom is where the, or the different colors of the world colonial empires um, during 1900. And you can see what the different colors are. I, I know the Netherlands, the United States, and the other independent countries kind of blend together. Um, the colors do. But you can see on the map here, the United States is obviously independent. We just got done talking about South America. So you can see South America is mostly independent, that entire continent. Um, and then you can also see some of these other territories that are going to be taken over. So you can see Africa has all sorts of different colors, and that's one region of the world that we are mostly going to focus on today since Africa completely gets dominated by the Europeans. And then also we're going to be focusing on parts of Southeast Asia, which is in this area right here. Um, and then also China. I know China right now looks independent, but there were spheres of influence within China, and we are going to be talking about those. One country in particular that dominates um, this era of imperialism is uh, Great Britain, and it's this light lavender color. You guys can kind of see on here, I mean, it controls territory in all parts of the world. You can see over in Canada, they control parts of Canada. They control a lot of South Africa and Egypt and India and Australia, um, and even some territory over there in Southeast Asia. So we're mostly going to be focusing on Great Britain today, but yes, we will talk about some other examples of the European countries taking over territory within the world. So we're first going to be starting about or starting to talk about Africa and I wanted to mention a few things about Africa, what Africa was like before imperialism. Africa was divided into several hundred of ethnic and linguistic groups, like several small little tribes and empires and villages and things like that. It was very native African, um, kind of what you would imagine it would be. Very, very traditional African beliefs, African culture. You can think of the clothing and the dress that they were also wearing too was very, very traditional African style. Now, um, with also having, obviously there was the African religions, uh, that are very specific to the tribes and the villages and things like that, but also the two other major religions that exist within Africa are Christianity, um, you know, that's Catholicism and Protestantism, and then also Islam. Islam was more popular in the northern part of Africa, especially over there by Egypt, the closer you get to the Middle East. And at this point in time, when, you know, we went through that age of exploration, the Europeans had mostly only settled along the coast because that's all they had to do. That's the only places they had to go in order to get slaves because if you remember, the, the Africans went and got other slaves to be sold into slavery. And so they never really had to explore the inner parts of the continent. And so for this reason, a lot of Europeans referred to Africa as the dark continent because we didn't really know what was going on inside of Africa. Uh, you know, we had never really traveled into, in, you know, the inner parts of Africa. Um, and also travel was limited due to the transportation. Obviously, there wasn't roads and things like that because they're still living very, very 
um, traditional um, African tribe and culture way. And then also there's many diseases that originate and are alive and well during this time in Africa. And so a lot of Europeans did not want to risk being exposed to these diseases then. So, you know, a lot of Europeans prior to the age of imperialism really didn't know what was going on in Africa. And that is why they referred to it as the dark continent. Here you can see an image. This is a Zulu war. I understand it's a little bit uh, blurry, but you can kind of see, I mean, this is traditional African culture uh, during this time period. It's exactly kind of what you would think. Um, you know, you can kind of see what he's wearing and they're also, you know, they use wooden spears and things like that. Obviously the industrialization and new technologies have not reached this continent at this point in time. So how does Europe, you know, kind of finally figure out like, hey, Africa has a lot to offer. They have so many different resources and we can make lots of money by controlling these different parts of Africa. Well, it all starts um, in the 1860s by a man named David Livingston. And Livingston just, you know, had this taste for exploration and wanted to know what was going on in new other parts of the world. And he was from Scotland and he becomes the first European to explore sub-Saharan Africa. Now, sub-Saharan Africa, you know, obviously that means below the Saharan Desert, and the Saharan Desert is in the northern part of Africa. And so sub-Saharan Africa, you know, I usually think Lion King, like the lush forests and waterfalls and the savanna and the grasslands and things like that. That's the part of Africa that he was exploring um, kind of what you would see in that movie. He did discover a massive, beautiful waterfall, one of the largest waterfalls in the entire world, Victoria Falls, um, which is over in the eastern part of Africa. And so, you know, for a long time, no one heard from David Livingston. He went on this exploration and it's like he just kind of disappeared and no one had really heard anything about him. So in 1871, a few years later, you know, they, they've worried, you know, what happened to David Livingston? We haven't heard anything from him anymore. Henry Stanley uh, sets out to go find Livingston. And during her, his search, he starts to explore the area known as present day Congo today. And he realizes how, much how many resources this area of Africa has. And he actually helps establish um, the Congo Free State in the name of King Leopold uh, of Belgium. And so Belgium technically is the first European country to imperialize a country within Africa. And this would be the Congo. And, you know, uh, we'll talk more and more about the Congo as this continues. But the Congo had unlimited amounts of rubber within that um, area. And so, you know, once little old Belgium, you know, guys, Belgium's not that large of a nation, little old Belgium goes and takes over the Congo. I mean, this just sets off the scramble for Africa. Everyone wants a little piece of Africa then. And so all the European countries are going to be going at it, trying to take over different parts of Africa. And all this started just because Henry Stanley was trying to find David Livingston, this guy who had gotten lost. Sets off this huge chain of events that is definitely going to change the way uh, the world is going to be for quite some time and will lead us into our very first world conflict. Now, um, here's a couple pictures here. This is Victoria Falls, what I talked about. Very, very beautiful waterfall in Africa. And there's Mr. David Livingston here in this picture up top. And so he was the original one from Scotland that tried to go explore Africa and got lost. And here is Henry Stanley. Henry Stanley, you can see he would have arrived over here on the coastline and went and explored this area of the Congo and, um, you know, declared that in the name of King Leopold and Belgium. So here's Henry Stanley over here. He was trying to find David Livingston. Now, eventually, yes, they do find one another. And the famous phrase uh, when Henry Stanley finally finds Mr. Livingston, he says, Dr. Livingston, I presume. And um, they realize they finally have found each other. Livingston was actually living with some um, African tribe over in Africa, you know, living life. And he was perfectly fine. Uh, but they finally figured out where he was and he was able to give them more information, you know, on how, what is Africa like? What do we expect here? And so forth. So this tiny little event, you know, just trying to find this man within this entire continent leads off to our scramble for Africa. So, um, because there's now this race 
for colonies within Africa. No one wanted to be left behind. Everyone wanted a little piece of the pie. And so you have countries like the Netherlands and Portugal and Italy and England and France and all and Germany also as well too. All these countries are going to go try and take over parts of Africa. Um, and especially people were looking for gold and diamonds. Those were the big money makers and that's what people wanted to try to find over in Africa. Now, in order to kind of set some boundaries and you know figure out like how is this going to go, uh, there was a conference called in 1884 in Berlin. Believe it or not, Mr. Otto von Bismarck originally called this conference. He knew what this was going to be like and he called this conference to kind of like get the rules set up and you know give everyone the expectations on how this should go, you know, try to prevent um, as many European conflicts from happening as possible. And so he sets up this conference in 1884, and it is in Berlin, which is the capital of Germany at that point in time. And, um, you know, Prussia has now joined. They have formed Germany. And so they are going to set up the rules for colonizing Africa. That is what the purpose of the Berlin Conference was. And here are some of the rules you can see listed on this slide um, that they kind of set. And obviously these have been simplified so you guys can understand them. But number one, any country could claim land. It did not matter if you were big or small, any country could be able to claim territory. Number two, they were able to divide Africa with no regard for ethnic or linguistic groups. Meaning like you, they could draw the line right between some village and this side of the village is now part of England and this side of the village is part of France or like mix different linguistic groups together and these people now are just part of one country and they don't even know how to talk to one another and they have these villages that might have hated each other but now are part of one country so they did not have to worry about the Africans at all and in fact no African rulers were even invited to this meeting um, and so they had no regard for the Africans they were going the Europeans were going to go march in there and do what they wanted to do um, and they did not ask the Africans for permission Obviously, no African rulers attended this, and they were not worried about splitting ethnic groups up or linguistic groups up. And by 1914, hopefully you guys remember that um, year. That's the year I've been talking about quite a bit. By 1914, the beginning of World War I, only two countries in all of Africa remained independent. Otherwise, the entire continent of Africa is going to be, be completely colonized by the Europeans. And this is all the, all the rules were set up at the Berlin Conference. And so here's a painting um, of the Berlin Conference. You know, it was just a meeting with all the diplomats and things like that saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. And remember, it was called by Otto von Bismarck um, of Germany. He, you know, he's a smart guy. He could anticipate what was going on here. And he knew um, some rules and things like that needed to be established. And then here's this cartoon I really, really like. It's a cool little drawing by some um, student here. You can see it's at the top his name was David. Um, but you can see all the different little people are pulling at Africa. They're all wanting their part of Africa. And you can see like King Leopold of Belgium is over here in the middle because the Congo is right over here in the middle. You can see Germany's taking over this part because they're going to take over parts of that as well too. You can see Great Britain's down here in South Africa, right? And Great Britain is going to take over parts of South Africa. So they're kind of showing, and there's French West Africa over here as well too. They're kind of showing not only all, all these countries like trying to pull and get their parts of Africa, but um, also the regions of Africa are pretty accurate as well too. So, um, obviously, we can't talk about imperialism without mentioning Great Britain, because Great Britain definitely, if there's, you know, a winner in the age of imperialism, it is definitely Great Britain. Um, and, you know, the phrase for Great Britain is that it was the empire in which the sun never sets, because they had different territories all throughout the entire world. And they also had territories that were scattered all throughout Africa as well, too. And, you know, Great Britain, of course, was very smart about this. You know, they had the largest navy in the world at that point in time. So they were easily able to go and sail and go find and explore these places and take over these places. But they also took over the strategic places. They took over areas that were heavily populated and um, heavy in natural resources. So you can see South Africa is definitely going to be a positive and also like Egypt has a lot of resources as well too and so they're going to take over that as well. 
Now, we are going to start to shift our focus on Southern Africa in particular. In order to talk about Southern Africa, I have to give you a little bit of background on what's going on here because it wasn't like Southern Africa just had never been explored before. Um, there were people living in Southern Africa from Europe, and these were actually Dutch farmers called the boyars. Okay, the boyars. So um, when I start to refer to the boyar wars, boyars is the Dutch. And hopefully you remember people that are Dutch are from the country of the Netherlands. And so these were people from the Netherlands that settled in Cape Town, which is in South Africa, um, in 1652. And these people were farmers, you know, just living their lives peacefully and so forth. However, in 1806, the English acquired Cape Colony from the Dutch. And so the English come in there and, you know, basically kind of start taking over. And the Dutch, you know, felt a little overwhelmed because of this. And they resented the English for this you know they were upset like this was our territory now you come in and swipe it you try to change everything and they didn't really like that so the dutch farmers are actually going to get up and they're going to migrate north from south africa and i'm going to kind of show you that on here and so you can see this was originally the dutch territory and the british are going to kind of come in and take this territory and they are going to migrate north in 1805 this is called the great trek the boyars which is the dutch um, are going to migrate north this way. And then in, in the end, you have Great Britain that is controlling Cape Colony. You know, they're farming and things like that. And the Dutch are over here in this territory. Kind of, you can kind of see where my mouse is, hopefully. Now, seems like everything's okay, right? I mean, the, the boyars were a little upset that they had to move. But right now, there's no conflict. There was no war or anything. They just got up and left. Um, to try to avoid any physical conflict with the British. However, now, when the boyars moved to that territory, they're going to encounter a people that are originally from that area and are one of the largest ethnic groups in Africa, and that is the Zulu. The Zulu are... Um, you know, an, an ethnic culture of Africa. They are an offshoot of the Bantu um, culture as well, too. Uh, but the Zulu were living in that territory. And at that point in time, uh, the African leader, Shaka, had united the Zulu nation. They had united all these people together. They had a very large following. Uh, and the Zulu warriors were known to be fighting against European slave traders. They're trying to fend off the Europeans. And also ivory hunters. You know, Europeans would go to try to find... Um, elephants and kill elephants to take their tusks for the ivory and things like that. And when the boyars went on this great trek over to, you guys can see here, when they went on this great trek over to here, well, here is the Zulu nation. And the, um, the leader of the Zulu, Shaka, is not very happy with this. And so the Zulu then are going to attack the boyars. Okay, and now when the Zulu attack the boyars, the British feel like they need to aid the boyars since they were the ones that forced the boyars to move to that territory. And so the British aided them with, you know, uh, weapons and money and things like that. And they were easily able to defeat the Zulu. You have to remember the Zulu are an ethnic African culture. They are still using wooden spears and things like that. And while the British and the boyars are using modern day technology of the time period and weapons like guns and things like that. So the Zulu really at that point in time did not stand a chance. Here's a couple of pictures of the Zulu um, people. This is Shaka. This is a picture of Shaka. This is the, the leader of all the Zulu here. And then this is just a picture of a Zulu warrior and what they would have looked like. And so the boyars fought the Zulu and unfortunately for the Zulu, the boyars won because they were aided by the British. Now, so what, right? Like, what does this mean then? Well, then we are going to move on to, um, you know, a, a series of wars. There's going to be the first Boyer War and the second Boyer War. Um, and, you know, both are kind of be, fought because of the same reason and, you know, um, the different issues and things like that. And so in 1867 the boyars find diamonds and gold in their territory. And you know how the British feel about trying to find diamonds and gold. And so uh, a few years later, 
they are going to be fighting a few wars over this because the British want that territory. Okay, now a man comes around in 1890, you can see, I mean, a few years later, it's quite a few years later, named Cecil Rhodes. And Cecil Rhodes is going to expand South Africa into that territory, and there is going to be several conflicts between the British and the Boyars, which remember, those are the Dutch farmers then. And he actually annexes the Boyar Republics and takes that territory away from the Boyars. Um, and the fighting lasted from 1899 to 1902. And like I said, there's the first Boyar War and the second Boyar War. And this is all because of gold and diamonds. Um, and so in 1910, the British will officially form the Union of South Africa. And so um, I'll get to my last point in a minute about the racial segregation. We'll kind of talk about that here in a second. But I want to spend a moment talking about Cecil Rhodes. Okay, here is Cecil Rhodes, and he is the one that kind of led the expedition for taking over that territory from the Boyars. Um, he was the British imperialist of the time period. He was probably the most famous man um, from Great Britain dealing with imperialism, and he actually is responsible for establishing the De Beers Diamond Company, which still even exists today. Um, and because of all the diamonds and things like they are... Um, harvesting from that territory, the De Beers Diamond Country, one of the largest diamond businesses in the entire world. He made millions of dollars off of this company. And this company, unfortunately, yes, is known for being involved in the blood diamond scandals within Africa. And so you can see here is Cecil Rhodes here. He is the, you know, the imperialist. He truly believed um, that the whites were superior to the Africans and that it is the job of the whites to take over all this territory. And you can see this picture here. He's straddling Africa from Cape Town to Cairo. And this was his big plan. He wanted to eventually create a railroad that would go all the way, you can see by his foot here, all the way from Cape Town to all the way up to Cairo, Egypt, uh, which would all be British territory. He said we would never leave British territory. And that's what his goal was. He wanted to take all of that for himself. Um, and so you can see that's, you've seen this picture before in your worksheet that we did previously, but now you kind of know what that means then. So back into my last point here where it talks about racial segregation in South Africa. Um, many of you may know South Africa has a very large white population, and that is because the British formed the Union of South Africa and sent people to live there. But also the people, when they took it over, um, were very uh, discriminated, I shouldn't say they vary, but they discriminated against Africans in South Africa. They did not have the same rights. There was um, extreme racial segregation. You know, the Africans could only use certain bathrooms or water fountains or different areas within South Africa. And a lot of people didn't agree with that. Uh, one man in particular you might be familiar with, and we'll talk more about him towards the end of the year, uh, but this is Nelson Mandela. Okay, you know, he fought against the the segregation and what the laws eventually known as the apartheid and so forth in South Africa. But that is all instigated by Mr. Cecil Rhodes. He did believe that the white man was superior and that they should have more rights than Africans. So he's very controversial today because, you know, there's a statue of him at Oxford University. And a lot of people feel like that statue should be taken down because he was an imperialist and, um, his views on other cultures and things like that and believing that the white race was superior to many. A lot of people don't believe that his statue should still stand. Very comparable to what we've seen in the United States this past year uh, with the statue of Robert E. Lee and the Confederacy and all that as well too. It's a very high debate over in Great Britain, but I believe from what I've read recently that they are going to let the statue stand over at Oxford University, which is a very uh, prestigious university in England. So that is our conflict of the Boyer Wars. Um, you know, the, the British went and kicked, them, kicked the people of the Netherlands out. Um, then they helped them fight against the Zulu. And then they kicked them out even more to take over that territory, the diamonds and so forth. So you guys can kind of see, um, this is a map that shows the Boyer advances. Um, there, the British are in red and the Boyars are in yellow. And eventually what it all ends up into um, is the Union of South Africa. So, and these are two smaller countries. I can't think of what their names are off the top of my head, uh, but it's all part of the Union of South Africa. So, 
There was a first and a second Boyar War, and this is the result of that, is the Union of South Africa. And this is where most of those diamonds and gold were, and that's where the De Beers Diamond Company was established. So, hopefully you guys are doing okay. We're making our way right on through this presentation, and we're going to kind of be moving into our next topic, and which is like, what's everyone else doing? You know, we talk about Great Britain a lot, um, but everyone else kind of followed Britain's lead on... You know, the idea that you need colonies for the necessary well-being of your economy. Like in order to be successful, you've got to have colonies, you've got to take their resources. And so the French followed suit and also, yes, the Netherlands followed their suit. Um, and by the 1900s, France had the second biggest empire in the world next to Great Britain. So France is going to make um, its way to... Um, and then also Spain and Portugal attempt to. They don't have as much luck as the French and the British... Uh, but they do take over some territories. Hey, okay? well, what else is everyone else doing? Like, what about Austria-Hungary? What about Russia um, and those other countries? You know, Germany and Italy and those countries as well, too. Well, Austria is more so worried about taking over territory in the Balkan region of Europe. Hopefully you guys remember the Balkan region of Europe. Um, if you want to glance over at the map in the room, you can. But the Balkan region is over there by Greece and Turkey, you know, kind of where the Ottomans were. Um, Yugoslavia, Bosnia, Bulgaria, um, all that territory right there is the Balkans. And so they're trying to, you know, take over parts of the Balkans. The Russians expanded into the uh, Caucasus, Caucasus Mountains and um, Central Asia and Siberia. That's where they're looking to expand to. So they're not really um, trying to take over parts of Africa. They're kind of worried about parts of Europe, actually, in Asia. Um, and then some other countries like Belgium and Italy and Germany, they took over some territory um, in Africa, but it wasn't very large territories in Africa. And then Germany, as you can see, it says on there, they also took an interest in East Asia and the Pacific Islands. And we'll kind of be talking about that as we keep going on here. So this is what a map of Africa looks like. Okay, you can see our two independent nations of Africa. They are in the white, and that is it. The one you really need to know is right over here. Hopefully you know what that country is in Africa, and yes, it is Ethiopia. Okay, and we'll talk about Ethiopia, because they had one of the only successful um, rebellions against the European country to try to keep their independence. Um, so you can see Italy like took over the Horn of Africa and Great Britain has all this territory here in the pink. And you can see France also did very well for themselves as well too. Germany got some, Spain got some, Portugal got some as well. And so this is by 1914. This is what Africa looks like completely taken over by everyone else. So besides these two white territories. So you might be thinking, like, did the Africans just sit there and take it? Like, I mean, what, what choices did they have? Um, yes, the Africans did try to resist the Europeans, but unfortunately they were unsuccessful. And so a lot of you guys might be thinking or wondering, like, well, what did this do to Africa? I mean, guys, you look at Africa today and you see, you know, some parts of Africa are so poor and hungry and they're starving and things like that. And this is a large reason why Africa is so far behind everyone else in the world is that they are controlled by other European countries for so long. Um, and, you know, they just weren't able to put up a resistance against them. They didn't have the technology. They didn't have the alliances and so forth. Um, and so you want, one big reason why Africa is behind everyone today is because of what happens during this age of imperialism. You can see that the Maji Rebellion of 1905 um, the Germans in East Africa squashed a spiritual uprising and they killed 26,000 Africans in the process of this. So Germany had to deal with a rebellion. And like I said, Ethiopia was the only successful resistance um, during that time. They were actually able, they knew they couldn't fight with those wooden spears, and they were actually able to purchase weapons from France and Russia and were able to defeat the Italians in 1896. This is very important to remember, especially um, if you're interested in World War II, because Italy will come back for Ethiopia eventually. Old Mussolini will come back for Ethiopia, but at the moment for right now, Ethiopia is going to remain independent, and the Italians are a little bit humiliated that they were defeated by the Ethiopians in 1896. So as you can see, the only star there, um, only, they were the only nation to resist the Europeans. 
So you guys can see some areas of resistance all throughout um, Africa. Um, and you guys can see um, Ethiopian resistance here. I talked about the Miji resistance, 26,000 people died. You know, there was resistance in Madagascar and all throughout Africa. Like they didn't just give up. They didn't just, you know, let them take over their country. Um, but they tried to resist and you can see Zululand down there. Um, but obviously they failed besides Ethiopia right here. They were able to resist them. So, and there's the king of Ethiopia. I cannot remember his name off the top of my head right now, but he was the king of Ethiopia. And he was the one that was smart enough to go buy new weapons to try to defend themselves against the Europeans because they knew the, techno the, the sources that they had was not going to beat modern technology. So he got with the ways and was able to purchase some modern technology to defend themselves. Now, I mean, were there any positives to being controlled by the Europeans? Yes, there were. Now, obviously, for most people, they probably think the negatives outweigh the positives, but there were some positive things that happened for uh, these territories within Africa. For example, it reduced local warfare. Tribes were not fighting as much against one another because they had a new enemy, and that was the Europeans. Uh, number two, the Europeans did improve sanitation. They built hospitals. They improved education. You know, they set up schools for these people and so forth. Um, and so they were receiving um, some better things in that aspect. And then also African project products, excuse me, were very, very popular in the European market. So they made a lot of profit off of them, but also to help the Africans, they improved their infrastructure. Infrastructure guys means like roads and bridges and things like that. And to easily transport things throughout Africa, railroads and so forth. Um, that is what we're talking about when we're mentioning infrastructure. How are you traveling through the inside of the country? And obviously they didn't have a lot of that stuff. And so the Europeans had to build a lot of that. And that did help them and start to modernize them a little bit as well too. Negatives, um, obviously you're, you're, you're losing your independence. Um, you lost all of the independence that you had. You're now being controlled by European power. Also, um, there was new diseases and things like that and people died from that. Um, and also another reason is that they started to grow cash crops and those, you know, cash crops are being sold just to make money. And so a lot of people were dying of starvation and famine uh, because they were not growing enough crops to feed people. And there was a breakdown in the traditional culture of African tribes. A lot of that culture was lost because this European culture was forced upon them. A lot of them were forced to believe in Christianity. A lot of them, you know, had to go through the, that whole idea of the white man's burden and they tried to civilize these people and so forth. So you lose a lot of the traditional African culture that had been thriving in that um, area for hundreds of years. A lot of that is lost. Now, enough about Africa for a little bit here. We're now going to kind of transition into Asia. Um, and talk about what's going on over there in Asia. So I kind of give you some examples of Africa. There are still more examples that we'll learn about as we go through. I just want to give you a main few, but now we're going to focus on Asia. So imperialism in Asia. Okay, let's take a deep breath. Okay, let's do this. So um, the last time we talked about Asia and we talked about India, we talked about the British East India Trading Company. Um, you know, they established this major trading company and it guys basically was its like own country over there in India, like this British East India Trading Company. It was a monopoly. They had rights to all the trading stuff down there. And also it had, it had its own army, its own army to defend it. And the army was called the Sepoys. Okay, the Sepoys. So with the decline of the Mughals and the defeat of the French, Great Britain controlled three-fifths of India, basically controlled most of India, okay? Um, because, you know, they defeated the French, they defeated the Mughals, which are over there in Asia. Um, they are going to control three-fifths of India. And what this kind of topic leads us into is the Sepoy Mutiny. This is a famous uprising by the Indians to try to take down the British that is um, going to be interesting. And so the Sepoys were, as I said before, they were the army for the British East India Trading Company, and they are Indian soldiers. That is what a sepoy is, an Indian soldier. And they felt that this British military rule was against their religious beliefs, okay, that it was against their religious beliefs. Most of these people are Hindu, 
Some of them are Islamic, um, but a large majority of them are Hindu during this time. So if you're wondering where India is, hopefully you know where India is, but there it is on the map. Um, you guys can kind of see over here and some other countries that are close to it, the Indian Ocean, the Bay of Bengal and so forth. Um, but there is India and that is the country we're talking about. Um, and so we are talking about the, about the Sepoy Mutiny or the Sepoy Rebellion. Um, so in 1857, the Hindus and the Muslims united against the British. They, they are sick of the British, they are sick of their military rule, and they are going to go try to take down the British Empire. And the British completely demolished them. They are not ready to take on the British at all. Um, and they crushed the revolt, and Parliament ended the company's rule of India. So the British East India Company really isn't controlling India anymore. It is the British government. And these sepoys are not in the military anymore. The British government is in control. And so this is all about these Indian soldiers that work for the British East India Training Company trying to rise up against the British because they felt like they were violating their religious beliefs. However, the British are just too tough and they will completely demolish the sepoys. Here you can see are some pictures um, of the sepoys. Yes, they were known for wearing their turbans. That is part of their culture there. And then also you can see a British soldier here with some Indian troops that helped fight against the sepoy mutiny. And so um, kind of gives you a visual there of what these soldiers are looking like because they are Indian soldiers. And this is the territory in which we are looking at. So you can see the area of the sepoy revolt is in the orange. Um, this orange circle here, that's where most of the fighting took place. Um, and you can see the British controlled area was the dark green, and that was in 1805. And then the British controlled area by 1857, after the Sepoy Mutiny, they control all of this and all this territory. So um, they were just controlling the dark part, and after this, they control all of it. The British East India Trading Company is not really in control at all anymore. So that is the Sepoy Mutiny. That's one example over there in Asia. But let's talk more about um, some other parts of Asia. Here's another picture of the Sepoy Mutiny. And our last picture before we keep moving on here, I think, um, is the British Empire. It, the empire in which the sun never sets. You know, we've talked about how they got control of all this. You can see that's where he wanted to build his railroad, Cecil Rhodes. You can see they controlled all of that there from Cairo down to Cape Town. Um, they controlled Canada. They controlled India. They controlled Australia. They're going to control parts like of Hong Kong and stuff like that over there. And there is the little tiny island itself of Great Britain. So let's move on. Another picture there. I forgot about this picture. Um, but it's just showing how England was then going to start taking advantage um, of Great, or of India. Sorry. And you can see India sends the raw materials to England, and then England actually turns it into the finished goods, and then they just sell it back to the Indians. So it's like they're overpricing their stuff, and the Indians are having to pay all this money, which the original product comes from India anyway. So we'll get more into that when we start talking about Gandhi, but you can see that's setting that up for eventually Gandhi to come in, you know, the 1940s and get its independence for India. But that's, they still have about 40 years or so. Now, China. Okay, let's talk about China because we have not talked about them in a while. I know we mentioned them briefly when I started to discuss my um, imperialism notes the other day. But old China, okay, China um, has a lot of resources like tea and silk and porcelain and spices and things like that. And they had great trading markets over there and plenty of cheap labor. The Chinese would work for very cheap. Um, and so it was just a perfect place to go and take over. And the Manchu, if you remember, they're the ones that controlled uh, China during the Qing Dynasty they looked down on foreigners. And if you remember from, when, from first semester, we talked about how China took on the policy of isolationism because they wanted nothing to do with the foreigners or the Western goods and services and so forth. And obviously, like I said, this would lead to their downfall because they are isolationists. They are closed off. They do not modernize. They do not industrialize. And they are too weak to keep up with European advances 
and technology. They are just not going to be able to handle it. So let's talk about some other examples with China here. Um, in the late 1700s, you can see this starts to happen earlier than the other forms of imperialism. It kind of starts to happen with the opium wars. Now, yes, I know what you're thinking. I just said opium, and yes, opium is a drug. Yes, there were wars um, about opium. And here's the deal, and here's what was going on. The British were trading opium with the Chinese, and the Chinese would just take more and more opium from the British, and then they realized this is a drug, and their people are becoming addicted to it, and they're wanting more and more, more opium. And the Chinese are like, look, Great Britain, like we can't accept this anymore. We're figuring out that the people are becoming addicted to it. We don't want to trade um, opium with you anymore at all. Well, British don't like that because that's going to hurt their profits. So in 1839, you know, th this opium trade had been going on for quite some time. War broke out because the Chinese tried to defy the British. And the, as I said earlier, guys, the British are easily going to defeat them because they're falling behind. They don't have the weaponry um, and the technology to try to defeat the British. So the Chinese are easily defeated and they are forced to sign what is known as the Treaty of Nang Ching. Yes, that's what that is. Treaty of Nanqing. Basically, China had to open more ports. They couldn't stay isolationists anymore. They had to open themselves up to the Western world. They had to pay war reparations. Remember, guys, that's money um, that the British had to spend on the war. The Chinese then had to pay them money because they lost the war. They also gave Hong Kong to Great Britain in the Treaty of Nanqing. And, you know, Great Britain is going to control Hong Kong for quite some time. And also, they granted foreigners the right to be tried by their own courts and law rather than those of China. So if some guy was over in Great Britain and broke the law, law over there, he wouldn't have to go to a Chinese court. He would get to go to his own British court and try uh, and go through that whole process. And of course, they're going to be more lenient on them in the British court than they are the Chinese court. So really, the Chinese laws meant nothing to the British because they could do whatever they wanted to do then. But this is really going to open China up to other countries and now China is going to be kind of like a sitting duck to these under other countries that are going to take out spheres of influence. And here are some um, Chinese and yes they are smoking opium in the picture here and so remember they figure out opium is a very very addictive drug. They tried to stop it the British wouldn't let them stop trade. They go to war about it. The Chinese lose. And so as I mentioned, um, it, this then opens themselves up to everyone. Okay, you know, Germany and France uh, and Japan and Russia all go try to take over parts of China and then enters in the United States. We haven't talked about them really at all. The United States was honestly late to the game of imperialism. They, you know, they were dealing with a civil war and all these different things, you know, building themselves up. Well, they finally get to the game and they're like, hey, guys, we want to make sure we get parts of China, too. Let's instigate an open door policy. You know, they can go in and out the door as they please. They can go wherever they would like and everything's fine and dandy. Well, no one opposed it. And so the open door policy was passed. And so that allowed the United States to get in on parts of China as well too, because the United States didn't get anything of Africa. That was already all taken up before the United States could even figure out what was going on. Um, and so this is how China gets, you know, territory over in um, China. This is how the United States gets territory over in China then. So remember, China, they carved spheres of influence. They didn't control the whole country, just little territories, little pieces of the pie. Hope you guys remember what that term is, spheres of influence. So here's our spheres of influence. You can see the different colors at the bottom there. The yellow is France, the orange is Britain, the green is Germany, the purple is Japan, and Russia is the red. Now, obviously, they're going to try to take over, um, you know, strategic areas within China, um, Beijing was still under the control of the Chinese, but they are, you know, we're taking over these little spheres of influence. You can see where Hong Kong is, and that's where the British took over. They were forced to give them to that, or give them that in the Treaty of Nanqing. And this is in 1910, so we're moving towards 1914. So guys, we are about done here, believe it or not. And the last um, country that I want to talk about is Japan. Okay, Japan had been living under the control of the Tokugawa shogunate, 
and have been practicing the policy of isolationism just like every other Asian country. Well, believe it or not, guys, this is a really ironic moment in history. Um, and I want you to pay attention here for sure. I know we're getting tired, but we're almost done. So over in Japan, they've been practicing isolationism, okay? They had not been modernizing or anything. Well, then the United States wants to show off how great and powerful they are uh, with this great white fleet. And it's all these ships, these massive ships to show them, all these battleships that we've built and so forth. The United States sails through or by the Tokyo Harbor, um, and, you know, requests to open up their ports for trade and shows off um, all these ships and things like that to the Japanese. And the Japanese are like, oh, no. Like, they see these massive iron ships, and the Japanese are still using wooden ships. And it's like, we better get ourselves moving into gear. And so, believe it or not, it is said, or a lot of historians believe, that the United States is the one that jump-started Japanese um, modernization. Okay. We jump started Japanese modernization and 40 or 50 years later, who attacks us to begin world war II? It is the Japanese. And believe it or not, we were the ones that jump started their modernization, which is kind of ironic. And so this modernization that's going to go through Japan is called the Meiji restoration. And this happens in 1868. And so people of Japan want to be modernized. They want to be industrialized. So the Tokugawa shogunate was overthrown and the emperor um, was restored in Japan. And they start to industrialize. They start to modernize. They build up their military. They're building up their infrastructure. And now they are going to go start to take over parts of Asia. And so, you know, they'll take over like parts of Korea and they'll take over parts of Manchuria. And now they are going to be competitive with the West. They are really the only Asian country that is comparable to the Western world and like really was able to imperialize and jump, um, you know, be able to handle themselves against these Western countries. And as you all know, hopefully most of you know, they are going to be a threat to deal with in World War II. And we are working our way towards there. They are involved in World War I, but not necessarily as much, obviously, as World War II. So looking at our last picture here, imperialism in Asia by 1914. Hey, you can see the different territories um, that have been conquered. You can see Korea was taken over by uh, Japan. China is all pink, I understand that, but there are spheres of influence. They just didn't mark them, so there are spheres of influence. France has French Indochina. This is Vietnam here. You know, that's a little bit important to American history, Vietnam. You can see the United States took over the Philippines. Um, the Netherlands took over like Indonesia, this territory over here. Great Britain took over India, uh, and you can see Portugal's in the purple, and so forth. So this is what we're ending up with in India. And I believe, guys, that is all we have for today. Hopefully, um, you guys got something out of this lecture, um, but that's all I got. So I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend, and I will see you on Monday.